My name is Dr. Mark Burrish. I'm an assistant professor and a headache specialist at UT Houston. The uh, longer, more drawn out name is the McGovern Medical School at the University of Texas Health Science Center at Houston, which is a bit of a mouthful. Uh, I'm also a director of the Will Irwin Headache Research Center, which is also part of a UT Houston. So as people come in, please feel free to introduce yourself in the comments below and kind of tell me where you're from. And I'll probably introduce myself again as more people join in. Now, you can type in questions at any time, and I'll plan to address them towards the end. So please don't be offended if I don't answer your questions immediately. Uh, I'm excited to talk about cluster headache uh, because it's one of the, my major research interests. And to me, as a scientist, cluster headache is equal, equal parts terrible in how it can affect people and fascinating in its biology and how it works. For today's discussion, I'm going to give a presentation for the first 15 minutes or so where I talk about the features of cluster headache, how it differs from migraine, its history, and how to treat it. Then we'll do questions and answers based on the comments you type in. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions you have as long as they're related to the topic. So let's start the presentation with the features of cluster headache. What is cluster headache? So this being the American Migraine Foundation, I should start by saying that cluster headache is a disease that is different from migraine. It's different in how it feels, what symptoms go along with it, and most importantly, it's different in what treatments work. In cluster headache, the pain is generally centered around one eye or occasionally the forehead or the temple close to the eye. And for most patients, it will always be on one side. If a patient has pain on the left, they will likely only have pain on the left side their entire life, never on the right. The pain, cluster headaches, the pain that cluster headache patients feel is intense. On a scale 0 to 10, if 10 is the worst pain you can imagine, it's generally a 9 or a 10. Um, but saying it's intense doesn't really quite do uh, cluster headache justice. Just to give you an idea of how intense this pain is, uh, patients with cluster headache who have had really painful experiences like childbirth, bone fractures, kidney stone, they almost always say that the cluster headaches are worse. Now, you may not have cluster headaches, and this is not meant to be a competition, so if you have another type of pain, I don't mean to be downplay your headache at all. I'm not saying that these patients are going through something worse than you or suffering more or even have more pain. It's just that as a doctor, I'm trying to describe the intensity of the pain for cluster headache patients as a group. So if a patient comes in and tells me, Doc, I went through childbirth and that was nothing compared to this pain. There are a lot of headaches that, that could be, but cluster headache really moves up higher on my list. Uh, so that's the intensity of the pain and the location. What it feels like, it's usually a sharp stabbing or throbbing pain. Um, these can be similar to migraine, but are different from a muscle pain that's usually aching or cramping. And it's even different from a nerve pain like shingles or sciatica, which is usually burning or itching or a pins and needles type of feeling. Um, the pain comes in attacks that last between 15 minutes or th and three hours. So that's a little different than migraine, it's a little shorter, but they may occur up to eight times a day. But just like migraine, pain is not the only part of the disorder. So with the pain, cluster headache patients get two other features, they're restless, and they have what are called cranial autonomic features. So for restlessness, patients will often pace up and down uh, and rock back and forth. They just don't want to be still. And that's very different from patients with migraine who want to be still when they have a headache. The cranial autonomic features are features on the face, like a watery eye or a runny nose. And if you've ever eaten a real hot chili pepper, you know what I'm talking about because you're activating this reflex that brings on these symptoms. Your eyes may water or turn red, your nose may run or get congested. And I think we here in Texas like to think we've got some bragging rights when it comes to chili peppers, but I'm looking at the list a little bit over here um, of people who have kind of come in and there's some good spicy food cultures here. So most of you probably have seen what happens when you bite into something spicy. Um, that same chili pepper reflex is activated in patients with cluster headache, except it's only on one side of the face. So if you have left-sided pain, only the left eye waters and only the left nose gets congested. And after each headache, all the symptoms go away. 
the pain gets better, the eye stops watering, and so on. Um, so I'm seeing a few people trickle in. Um, welcome. Just to reintroduce myself to those of you just joined, uh, my name is Dr. Mark Burrish. I'm a headache specialist at UT Houston and director of the Will Irwin Headache Research Center here in Houston. And today we're talking about cluster headaches. Uh, so just kind of looking at the, the list up here, welcome from uh, Indiana. Um, I have not tried Trinidad scorpion pepper. That sounds very interesting, but uh, that's not something I've tried yet. Um, and yeah, thank you guys very much for, for being here. So, uh, so, so far we've talked about kind of the, the features of, the basic features of cluster headache is a very intense pain. Um, it is usually around one eye and then patients get these kind of other things that go along with it, like a watery eye or a runny, runny nose just on that side of the face, almost like they ate a chili pepper, but just on one side. Um, and then they get this restlessness where they just don't want to sit still. And the attacks are pretty short. They're more like 15 minutes to three hours, but they can occur um, up to eight times a day. So let's talk about some of the other features of cluster headache. Um, in addition to the intense pain and the restlessness and the watery eye. Um, there's some really fascinating other features of cluster headache. Um, so first of all, cluster headache attacks are remarkably clock-like. So while you can have up to eight headaches a day, most patients have one to three headaches per day and they happen at almost the exact same time of day. So one patient may have headaches every day at 11 p.m. Not 11.30, not 10.30, 11 p.m. Uh, patient number two may have them every day at 10 a.m. For a lot of patients, you really can set your watch to when these headaches happen. Um, and if you look at multiple studies around the world, the most common time for a patient to have headaches is 2 a.m. It doesn't matter if you're asleep or awake. It doesn't matter what time zone you're in. It's 2 a.m. in studies in North America, Europe, and Asia. And this clock-like pattern is very rare for any type of pain. Um, so it's very, that's why I say it's kind of equal parts terrible and fascinating to me as a scientist. Um, another interesting thing is how fast these headaches ramp up and down. Uh, a cluster headache attack will typically go from no pain to maximum in five to 15 minutes. And then when it ends, it will also ramp down very quickly over five to 15 minutes. Um, There's some other interesting things like the triggers. Many patients can trigger an extra attack with alcohol pretty quickly. So I've had several patients tell me, you know, doc, before I finish a beer, before I finish a glass of wine, I will already have an extra cluster headache. So many patients stop drinking alcohol altogether um, when they're having headaches. Um, the other things that trigger cluster headache include nitroglycerin, which is medicine used for cardiac chest pain like angina, uh, and things like excessive heat. So either you're hot outside or you're exercising, but something gets your body temperature up. Um, now there's two versions of cluster headache, and this is actually where the term cluster headache gets its name. So the vast majority of patients, about 90%, will have a headache cycle lasting several, uh, let me pull this a little closer, several weeks or months, um, and then will be headache free for months or even years it's as if the headaches cluster together. So during the headache-free cycle, um, patients won't have a single headache, alcohol won't trigger a headache, and they don't need any medication. So this version where you have kind of distinct clustered periods of headache with clustered periods of just headache freedom um, is called episodic cluster headache. However, there's about 10% of patients who have chronic cluster headache with either no headache-free periods or very brief headache-free periods. So how does cluster headache differ from migraine? Um, for those of you listening who might have migraine, some of you may be listening and thinking, yeah, that doesn't sound like my headaches, but others may not be so sure. So it turns out that some migraine patients will have some of those cranial autonomic symptoms during their headache, like the watery eye, their stuffy nose. At the same time, cluster headache patients can have features more typical of migraine like light sensitivity, noise sensitivity, or nausea. Um, the best things that distinguish cluster headache from migraine, in my opinion, are the duration. So cluster headaches last three hours or less and migraines four hours or more. The frequency, you can have up to eight cluster headaches in a day, but usually you just get one migraine a day. The response to movement, so cluster headache patients feel restless, like they have to move, 
while movement usually makes migraines worse and they just want to lie, patients just want to lie and be still. And then the rapid onset and offset. So cluster headaches will go up quickly over 15, 15 minutes and then ramp down quickly over 5 to 15 minutes. Migraines typically come on a little bit more gradually, but also don't go away quickly. They also go down fairly gradually. So those are kind of the things I use to distinguish the two. Um, now you can have both. Uh, having cluster headache doesn't prevent you from having migraine and vice versa. But if you have both, the headaches don't always come together. When I see patients with both, they usually describe headache number one, and that sounds like a migraine, and they say, at other times, doc, I'll have a different headache, and that sounds like a cluster headache. So what do we know about cluster headache? Um, cluster headache is much less common than migraine. It's about one in a thousand people. And unlike migraine, which is more common in women, cluster headache is more common in men. Um, cluster headache typically starts in your 20s or 30s, and there seems to be this rule of one, two, or three. So the most common pattern seems to be one to three headaches a day, and the cycle of headaches for people who have the episodic version is one to three months. And that pattern usually occurs about once a year. Um, so basically patients will say, I get headaches twice a day for two months, and then it goes away for a year, and then it'll come back the following year for a couple months, twice a day. For a, a mechanism of cluster headache, this is still kind of in the kind of early stages of our understanding of this. We know there are three brain systems that are involved. The first is the pain system. Um, there's a kind of a headache center, we think, towards the base of the brain um, that connects the, the, the facial pain and the neck pain. And that pain system is actually shared by, by other headaches like migraine. So not surprisingly, some of the medications that work on this system treat both cluster headache and migraine. The second system is the autonomic system. That's the one with the chili pepper that causes the changes in the face like the bloodshot eye and the watery eye. And the third system is the hypothalamus. So the hypothalamus is a collection of cells deep in the brain, behind the eyes, that controls a lot of basic daily processes like temperature, hunger, your biological clock, and hormone regulation. So in cluster headache, we think that the hypothalamus gets activated first. People have done some imaging studies, studies showing that this area gets activated right at the beginning of a, an attack. Um, and then the hypothalamus connects to the pain system and the autonomic system to trigger the rest of the features. Uh, how these areas get activated, though, how they get connected, that part is still unclear. Um, so finally, kind of for the presentation part before we get to the questions, how do we treat cluster headache? So there's three lines of treatment. Um, these are kind of similar to uh, migraine in a sense. We have as-needed medications. Those are pretty straightforward. They're meant to break the current headache, but they don't prevent the next headache from happening. Um, there's bridge medications. Um, those are medicines meant to be short-term preventives. You can take them for a few days or weeks to decrease how many headaches you have, but they can't be taken long-term because of side effects. And then you have preventive medicines, which are meant to be taken every day to prevent how the headaches happen, um, and how often they happen, and how intense they are. So let me go through a couple of, of each one and, and kind of what our first line or our more preferred medications are. So on the as-needed side, the two most effective um, and most recommended are oxygen gas and sumatriptan. So oxygen gas is exactly what it sounds like. It's pure oxygen gas that you inhale. Um, for cluster headache, it has to be a large mask and not the little tube that goes in the nose because you really need a high volume of oxygen it, it tends for this to work. Um, so other commonly used medic, uh, the other commonly used medication is injectable sumatriptan, uh, also often known as Imitrex. Uh, so sumatriptan comes in multiple versions. There's a pill, a nasal spray, and an injectable medication. Uh, these are also used for migraine, but um, for patients with cluster headache where they only last 15 minutes sometimes, the injectable does seem to work much better and much quicker. Um, other medications sometimes used to break a headache are other versions of medicines ending in triptan, especially zolmatriptan or zomic. More recently, there's actually a device that goes on the neck 
It's basically a wearable device called a non-invasive vagus nerve stimulator, or the brand name is GammaCore. Um, it's essentially a wearable device uh, in the sense that you don't, there's no needles. You hold it to your neck during a headache and turn it on, and it sends electrical stimulation, which you can turn up and down, um, that activates the vagus nerve and shuts off the headaches. Um, the device seems to be just like the medicines we use. It does take a few minutes for its full effect, and it works in some patients, but not all. It does seem to work better in patients with episodic cluster headache than chronic for reasons that we really don't understand. Um, so that's the kind of the as-needed side. The primary bridge medication is steroids. Um, steroids often work very well, but they have a lot of risks tied to how you take them. So we typically try to limit it to a few days or weeks. For a lot of people, it's an oral version, something like prednisone. Um, you can do steroid injections into the back of the head. Um, and a lot of people ask, well, how does a, an injection to the back of the head help a headache where it's primarily centered on, on the face or the eye? Um, all of those parts of the head track back down to this one headache center. So if you can block or get steroids kind of into any part of that, um, and it seems like the occipital has been the, the most studied and the most used, it seems to kind of modulate that system. Uh, so the final medications are preventive medicines, and there are a lot of these. Um, the first line is verapamil, which is a blood pressure medication. Um, it often takes a few weeks to fully take effect because we have to ramp up on the medicine somewhat slowly because it's a blood pressure medicine has effects on the heart. We're basically giving patients who don't need a blood pressure medicine something to treat their cluster headaches. The other medicines we use are sometimes topiramate or topamax uh, or trokendi or qdexi or the other names. This is an anti-seizure medicine that is sometimes also used for migraine. Um, lithium, which is a medication used for bipolar disease, also called manic depression. Uh, and this one's actually very interesting as a, a scientist because it works for uh, the fact that lithium works for both of these diseases. Uh, they're very cyclical diseases um, and, and they kind of turn on and off in some ways. And so it's just interesting that these two um, are really the effective uh, diseases for, or the lithium's the effective disease for them. Uh, melatonin, which not surprisingly works on the circadian clock or clock system, and patients have these cyclical. Uh, circadian headaches, and then baclofen, which is a, a muscle relaxant. That device that goes on the neck, the gamma core or non-invasive vagus nerve stimulator, that can also be used on a regular basis a couple times a day to prevent cluster headaches. And then the most recent one that's come out is one of these new injectable medicines called emgality, or the other term is galcanazumab. And that was shown to be effective in episodic cluster headache, but not chronic cluster headache. Um, migraine patients may be familiar with this medicine because it's also effective for migraine, but the dose for cluster headache is much higher, or at least a little bit higher than the dose for migraine. Um, interestingly, one of the other injectable medications called Ajovi or Freminazumab was not effective for cluster headache in clinical trials, and the third, Amovig or Arenumab, hasn't been tried in clinical trials. We don't know why Mgality was effective, but Ajovi wasn't. Uh, there's a lot of possibilities. Sometimes it has to do with the medicine itself. Sometimes it has to do with how the clinical trial was set up because they weren't exactly the same. Uh, and finally, there are clinical trials on cluster headache. Um, at the time of this webinar, there are some currently underway. Uh, and I would recommend, if you're interested, getting on your computer and um, navigating over to clinicaltrials.gov and searching for cluster headache. Um, there you can see which studies are, are actively enrolling, uh, which studies are about to recruit uh, and kind of getting set up, or which ones have closed. They'll actually also tell you which cities and countries they're doing the study so you can see if it's local to you. 